let me call this, um, I guess the mathematics overview is a bit too vague. Um, maybe this is the uh, way to title it. <laughs> let me call it coordinate representations and uh, product of vectors. So let me start out with the coordinate representation. That's uh, probably the most uh, intuitive part that we can start with. So um, let me start out with something that kind of refers to what I did on Friday and something that I think most people are familiar with. I hope you feel comfortable working with uh, two-dimensional stuff with the XY coordinate system. And if you have a point in this plane, um, it could be this point. Let me just label a few different points. So we could be talking about this point in the first quadrant, or we could be talking about this point in the fourth quadrant, or we could be talking about this point in the second quadrant. Or I can, you can be talking about a collection of points. And when you have these different locations in space you want to represent, um, the Cartesian representation is very intuitive. You have uh, the axis, you basically drop down a perpendicular line to your axis, and you read off the numbers. That's what the Cartesian representation is. And something that you have learned, I think usually in trigonometry class, is the polar representation of these points. So for the polar representation, what you are imagining for each one of these points is you imagine describing them not by components, X and Y, but by distance and direction. So for this point, my P1 here, I might have this distance R1 and this angle here, theta1. And um, and the same deal with the, all these other points. So my uh, point two might be described as, I can make my angle go either direction. I can definitely have my angle go in, in clockwise direction, uh, theta two, and this would be considered a negative angle, or I can go the other way uh, with angles. Sometimes there's more than one way to get to the same place. And um, so this point would be at a distance R2, at an angle theta to uh, measure the, from the positive axis. axis. And uh, my point three would be at distance R3 at some angle x uh, theta three uh, from the positive x axis. And, um, and you might remember the relationship between these two ways of representing your, uh, your point in space. So um, so if you are starting out with your component description, then you can say my, my distance, that you can get from Pythagorean theorem. This is a right triangle with the legs x1 and y1. So the hypotenuse of the triangle will be given by, uh, or I guess this is the Pythagorean theorem. The hypotenuse squared is equal to uh, sum of the squares of the legs. Or if you are solving for R1, it'll be square root of x1 squared plus y, not y2, y1 squared. Um, so that's the distance, it comes from Pythagorean theorem. And the as for the angle, the most common way we express these angles is uh, through the trick, I, uh, not identity, uh, tr trick expression. So tangent of the angle is the opposite side over the adjacent side. It involves only the components that you already know. So we can say tangent of theta one is y one over x one. And in fact, this is the representation I prefer over the version that might say um, theta one is equal to arc tangent of y1 over x1, and that mainly has to do with some ambiguity um, in this expression because of the way arctangent function has to be defined. Uh, for example, in this version, there isn't an easy way to tell between a, a point that's in the first quadrant and a point that's in the third quadrant because the ratio of y1 over x1 is always 
uh, positive, whether they are both positive or both negative. Uh, but this expression, it, um, so it doesn't make a judgmental call on which quadrant your angle must be beforehand. Uh, it's another exercise you have to go through to figure out if uh, uh, your theta one, which gives uh, the ratio of the components is, you know, whichever quadrant it's in. So, so anyways, so this is a way you might relate um, starting from the component uh, expression, how you might go to the polar representation of your point um, or your vector. This is actually what we could easily call a vector. Although it's probably only in physics class where you see that explicit uh, reference. And you can also go the other way. If uh, somehow, if you are given the distance and the, and if you are given the polar representation of your, uh, of your vector, of your point or of your vector, then you can represent it Kind of the way you have been doing in physics 4A when you work through um, a force analysis question and you have to break forces into components. So here, all I have to do is break this vector into X and Y component. And when I do that, my X component is R1 cosine theta one. And my Y component is R2 sine theta R2, R1, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't have done that one, two, three thing. R1 sine theta one. So this is the way to get from the polar representation to component representation. And one of the things that you learn in trigonometric class is these theta ones, they can actually take on any value. They don't have to be an acute angle. They can take any angle from zero to two pi, or they can even be greater than that, and uh, and it'll all work out. Um, these these uh, uh, expressions are valid for all values of thetas and the positive values of r. R is only allowed to be zero or positive. So, so this is a review of something you have seen. Um, nothing new, nothing surprising here, and uh, I wanted to start from here to expand into um, coordinate representations for three-dimensional space. And so in physics 4A, for most of the class, we have only dealt with two-dimensional representations. Uh, it's because even though we live in three-dimensional world, very often you can find a suitable plane so that all the interesting stuff only happens in a two-dimensional space. Um, there were some exceptions when you do rigid body motion and deal with the rotation and angular momentum, then you have to bring in three-dimensional space. But with those uh, small uh, set of exceptions, you could, uh, you could uh, deal with it, uh, just uh, uh, dealing with a subset of your space. That won't be the case in electromagnetism. That's uh, frankly the reason Math 3C is a core requisite for this class. If I could, I would make a Math 3C prerequisite, but I know I can't, so I, <laughs> I don't, didn't try. Um, the it's in your multivariable calculus class when you learn to deal with the three-dimensional space uh, more fully than you have learned to do in your other classes. So. So let me first start off with the uh, uh, coordinate representations for uh, our three-dimensional space. And I guess the place to start maybe is to first uh, describe a uh, projections space or the, let me first start out with the, the x, y axis first. And I'm going to define my x and y axis so that it defines a, what looks like a horizontal plane. So, and I'm drawing it in perspective view. So drawing my x and y axis in perspective view, it would look something like this. Um, you have to imagine you are kind of staring at this um, from over a plane and x axis is coming towards you, y axis is going to the right. You'll see why I'm uh, describing those directions in that a bit of an unusual way. Um, I guess, yeah, and I, I guess I could have, I could describe uh, this as x and y, but somehow I think it, it's uh, less commonly drawn that way. 
Mm. Uh, uh, let me just go with uh, how I how it's usually drawn. Um, so when you're drawing three dimensional axis, um, we are limited by the fact that we are working with only two dimensional drawing. So we'll have to have some convention for properly representing these uh, three dimensional points. Um, so, so oh, I, let me draw the z-axis. I need my third dimension. And with my x and y-axis drawn this way, my z-axis has to point upward. Um, the constraint on my z-axis is it has two constraints. Uh, one is that it must be perpendicular to my other two axes. So my z-axis is perpendicular to my x-axis and it's also perpendicular to my y-axis. Uh, that's one constraint. And the second constraint, it did, what I have drawn here is what might be called a right-handed axis. And if the phrase right hand reminds you of a right-hand rule, when you are doing a cross product, that's exactly where it comes from. So with this representation, when you do, uh, when you do x cross y, you get a uh, direction of the z axis. So, and so it's right handed axis is x cross y, applying right hand rule gives you z axis. It's the way we have chosen to um, pick that semi arbitrary convention. convention. So, and, and this is the perspective view. So it necessarily uh, leaves a bit of an ambiguity in. Um, where things actually are and i guess if you want to avoid that ambiguity you need to draw a couple more views so for example i might draw a view from um, plus x uh, view from plus x so imagine an observer who's sitting here right in the direction of x-axis and just looking down the x-axis uh, for that observer, uh, my y-axis will uh, point to the right, and my z-axis will point directly up. And my x-axis is going to uh, point towards me. I'm just trying to point it towards you <laughs> into the camera. Um, and we have a, we use these two notations to indicate vectors that are either coming out of the plane or vectors going into the plane. It's meant to... Um, be evocative of an arrow. Uh, this is you are looking at the arrow tip. Here you are looking at the arrow tail. So here the x-axis, it will be coming out of the page towards you. So um, I would represent this as x-axis. And uh, when you are viewing this way, this is necessarily going to collapse uh, basically all the points with the different x values into this one plane. So you might need a, uh, a second view uh, from another plane, uh, from another perspective. Maybe a view from um, plus y direction. So when you imagine you have an observer who is here and just looking down the axis, then imagining yourself in that place. Um, so your y axis will be coming towards you. That's how we set it up. And my z-axis is still going to point upward. And my x-axis, it should be pointing leftward. Okay. Um, I guess between these two views, it might distinguish everything. Basically, if the two points are uh, diff um, so this view cannot distinguish when um, two points just differ in x value. But when you look at this view, you will see that uh, when they do have different x value. So, so let me use this. Um, let's see. Oh, but I think for convenience sake of uh, what I want to describe, I do think I want to describe just one more view uh, that will help me describe one peculiar thing about a coordinate system I want to describe. So, so let me just draw one more view that's uh, going to be uh, complementary of the other three views I've drawn so far. And it'll frankly be duplicative of some information. Um, so you could have a view from uh, plus z-axis. 
And frankly, um, I guess the way we imagine our orientation, um, somehow I feel like I have a freedom to kind of rotate around as I view. So I can choose to rotate my uh, point of view in such a way that I see my z-axis coming out of the plane and my x and y-axis the way they are normally drawn. So that's the third view that I can. And I think this degree of freedom, it frankly existed here and here too. I can just rotate this around and it'll still describe you from plus x, but somehow <laughs> thinking of g as being upward the direction and just locked into that um, thing. It, it, yeah, and anyways, um, there's a rather um, thought-provoking question of when you look into a mirror, why do you think of yourself being flipped around the left to right instead of up down? But let me not get into that since it's, that's not relevant for us right now. Um, so this is the description of our um, three-dimensional um, axis. And when you imagine a point um, point in this uh, three-dimensional space, and you want to describe that three uh, that point. It it's uh, perhaps easiest to describe that point in terms of its uh, Cartesian coordinate. So you can imagine uh, this point here. It's uh, um, let's see this point here. Then um, so this would be the y value of the point x value of the point. I'm trying to, how do I match this up? I think uh, uh, this is, ought to be my g value of the point. <laughs> so um, this point here, I can represent it in my um, um, other views here. So it would look like something like this, um, this, and this. So these would be g naught, x naught, not x naught, that's y naught, y naught. And in this view, there's no way to indicate the x value. In this view, I have x naught, g naught, and here I have x and y value of the uh, point. And the Cartesian representation, it's um, I think it's easy to start from your intuition for the two-dimensional space and just to expand it out to the, the uh, just add one more dimension to what you already had. What's going to be a bit more challenging is the polar representation. There is a ver version of the polar representation that's quite uh, easy extension of uh, what you've had in two dimensions. Let me do that one first. So a uh, version of a polar representation that um, that generalizes more easily from your 2D intuition would be this one, um, which is you keep everything that you had for your 2D plane. So all the descriptions that you had for your XY plane, you keep it. So for your polar representation there, you would say, okay, um, I have this, uh, distance to the projection of the point onto my xy plane. So you have this distance. Um, you could use the letter R for that distance. Sometimes people use a different letter uh, to say that it's not really the distance to the actual point. You are just uh, reaching out to the projection onto the xy plane. Um, and the polar representation included distance and direction. So I need an angle here. I could call this theta. Although with this version of polar representation, there can be different conventions. We might use a phi for a reason that will be more evident to later. And um, and we would keep the um, we would keep this portion as the third parameter needed to describe a three dimensional point. This is a thing to uh, be aware of. However many dimensions you have, you have that many number of parameters to describe any given point in your space. So, so this is a um, so this uh, representation, which uses the distance along x y plane, angle from the plus x axis 
to that uh, point on the xy plane, uh, projection on the xy plane, and the g coordinate. This is what someone might call, or this is what <laughs> everyone calls, a cylindrical coordinate system. And to some sense, this is, um, it's really simple. It's a way of dividing up your three-dimensional space into really two-dimensional um, two dimensional representations. So um, I guess one obvious uh, version is this uh, um, here, where you have, uh, it's a literally, uh, you, you, here you are literally describing the projection onto x, y plane, ignoring the g coordinate. So, so it's this portion that you are old two dimensional polar coordinate system, and you just uh, tack on one additional dimension. And yeah, and I guess I, well, and another way um, this uh, also limit to your three dimensional thing into a two dimensional plane is you can also think of this uh, representation along this uh, plane, the plane which contains the origin and the point that you're considering and the uh, G axis. So here the, your S coordinate would behave almost like the X coordinate that you had in the prior two-dimensional uh, coordinate system, and your G coordinate would be behave like the Y coordinate system. So if you somehow wanted to know the distance to the whole point, then you would say, oh, the distance R is the square root of S squared plus G squared. So that's another sense in which this cylindrical coordinate system is a way to divide up your three-dimensional representation into different slices of two-dimensional representation. All right, so that's uh, one way of, uh, um, that's one version of the polar coordinate system. And the, um, the version of the polar coordinate system that took me really much longer amount of time to learn and uh, gain a bit of, gain a sense of familiarity with, it's the spherical coordinate system, and um, this, and the, so so let me try to describe this uh, from scratch here. Um, I remember th this is I don't know why I the first place where I had to struggle with this system was in my astrophysics class, um, but it took me a while to fully comprehend everything in that. So. Describing the spherical coordinate system, um, I guess the thing understanding to start from is that you are dealing with one distance and two angles. So you are dealing with the distance from origin all the way to the point. That uh, uh, that's just the distance. Um, uh, and let me give letter R for that. Or yeah, this could be R vector. Or if you imagine taking the magnitude, then that's the R distance from origin to the point that we are describing. And we need to pick two angles with which um, to specify a particular direction. And there's a convention that's been chosen. The first angle that we use to constrain where this point can be is the polar angle. It's a, this angle here, angle between my three-dimensional vector and the z-axis. And in physics classes, we give letter theta for uh, this angle. So that angle can be represented, um, you know, I don't think this angle theta can be represented on any of my drawings here. So if I were to draw this line and label this angle, or draw this line and label this angle, I'll bet you that these are not going to be equal to theta. Um, basically, the only way to get this angle theta is you have to think of a representation in this plane that contains the origin, z-axis, and the point. Um, only in that plane, which the angle, it'll be theta. So, um, so yeah, in none of these viewpoints, I can actually identify that angle uh, theta. The only place where I can label it, but know that I can't quite uh, measure it by 
taking a protractor to the drawing is in this perspective view. But that polar angle, the angle between the, the vector and the z-axis, that's one angle that you use to uh, co start constraining the different places your point can be. Before that, with only this constraint, your point could be basically anywhere on the sphere of radius r. That's why it's called the spherical coordinate system. Um, so once you specify the polar angle, then the only place where your point can be is um, uh, within this circle here. Um, so if you kept your um, if you kept your r the same, you kept your theta the same, and trace out all the different points your uh, vector can be, it'll trace out a circle that looks like this. And it's going to be a circle that's uh, parallel to the xy plane. So we can finish the remainder of the description of this uh, vector in three-dimensional space by describing what we see in the projection onto the xy plane. So this point here, which is a projection of this point onto xy plane, will be part of the circle. So if you draw a line from origin to that point, there's the angle from x-axis to that line. This angle, uh, which is called azimuthal angle, we give it letter phi. This is the azimuth. Um, I think that's the correct term for it. This is the azimuth uh, for, that, for that point. And I can represent this angle here in the xy plane. So I have this uh, projection of the point onto xy plane. Projection meaning I just ignore the z-axis. And um, the azimuthal angle there would be this angle phi. And, and it's uh, this uh, spherical coordinate system where um, you do need more work visualizing and making sure that you can connect your spherical representation, which would be r phi theta. This is your, um, or yeah, let me just leave it that way. This is your spherical representation. And just because there are two different conventions out there, one that mathematicians use and one that the correct one that we physicists use, let me just give these actual labels, the, their names, because we call them by the same name. We just use different letters. This is your azimuth. And this is your polar angle. Um, mathematicians have those two labels swapped for some reason for some unreasonable reason. So given this uh, spherical representation, the, the task that, uh, that if you are able to do it, then you can tell yourself that you understand uh, this uh, coordinate systems well enough is, um, is how to go from here to the representation that describes the x, y, z component. And this is where some visualization work is useful. Let me spend the next couple minutes uh, just writing out the expressions for these components. So you're going to see these representations in a couple different calculations of um, electric field by direct integration that you'll see as part of this week's content. And um, it's one of those things that you don't really have to do. In fact, the whole thing about Gauss's law that you will learn this week is that <laughs> it's also trying to avoid having to do that difficult multivariable calculus calculation. Um, but even so, it's uh, good to know the basic descriptions in case you ever have to fall back onto them. So, so in going from the spherical representation to the Cartesian representation, the easiest component to handle is the Z component. You can kind of guess at that because um, we treated the g-axis as the special axis. It's the first uh, axis to which we determine the angle theta uh, from our vector. So we can, uh, you can imagine a, a right triangle in this way. Uh, right triangle consisting of the r as the hypotenuse. And um, there you can draw a line perpendicular to the g-axis. That's uh, one of the legs of the right triangle. And the 
one of the other leg along the z-axis, that would be our z component. So considering that right triangle, you should be able to reason yourself that z component is given by r times cosine theta, since um, since this is the the um, since the z component is the side adjacent to the angle theta. The x and y components are what I had trouble with when I was first learning spherical coordinate system. I wanted to say that x is r cosine phi and y is r sine phi. And what I'll tell you is that that's wrong. <laughs> um, and the, the thing to make sure that you think through and make sure that it makes sense to you is that before we start addressing x and y components, we first have to take the projection of the point onto the xy plane. And in this act of taking projection, this side here, this is not r. This, this is, uh, you can actually imagine this right triangle. This is the right angle. And this being theta, this should be theta. Um, and this is the hypotenuse, is r still. So this side here, the leg that's uh, in the xy plane, um, that's, uh, the, the, that's the leg opposite to the angle. So the length of this leg should be r sine theta. So this is the length of the vector, uh, or length of the projection of the vector on the xy plane. And using this as a starting point, then you describe x and y component. So when you work it through, your x component should be r sine theta times cosine phi. And y component should be r still sine theta. We are starting from the same hypotenuse times sine phi. So, so this is the translation from the uh, from the, the spherical representation to the Cartesian representation. And we are not really going to use this too often or ever, if you hard, probably hard at avoiding using it. <laughs> but the reason I thought it would be worthwhile to cover this um, as a review is you do need to visualize the three-dimensional things quite a bit um, in this class as we do e &M stuff. And I thought uh, thinking through the, say, spherical coordinate system, there is a way to start practicing how to visualize a three-dimensional object, three-dimensional vector field, like electric field, and things like that.